Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History After the Bell, where I get to talk about stuff and not worry about the kids. How about that? We're going to take a look at the Supreme Court case, Glossop versus Gross, which just came out, written by Samuel Alito, not dealing so much with the constitutionality of the death penalty, but rather the manner of execution in the death penalty. And we're going to take a look at court precedent. There's a few court cases that already deal with this. And then like all good videos, you're going to leave your opinions down in the comments below. All right, guys, so we have three court cases to deal with, and all of them are going to basically uphold the state laws which are executing people in these different manners. The first court case, you have to go way back to 1879, Wally Wilkerson versus Utah. And Wilkerson shot somebody in a bar over a game, accused him of cheating, bang, bang, bang. He's duly convicted, and he actually chose a new method which was being offered in 1879 in Utah, which was firing squad. After he decided that, his lawyers then bundled up the case and went to Washington. And they're claiming now that Utah's use of the firing squad is going to violate the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual ban. And what the court basically says is that, look, Utah made this decision. Uh, it's constitutional to have the death penalty. What's to say that firing squad is no more inhumane than hanging? So Wally went to the death. And he actually had a botched execution. They put a mark on his heart and he moved a little bit and they missed it. They shattered, I believe, his chest collarbone. They shot him in the abdomen. It took him eight or nine minutes to bleed out with him begging them to uh, have them shoot him again. So that didn't work out really well. We have our next court case in the state of New York. Auburn Prison is going to use the electric chair for the first time in 1890. And we have the court case of Kelmer versus New York. William Kelmer from my home city of Buffalo is a raging alcoholic who loses his cool and uses a hatchet to kill his common law wife. He's then sentenced to the death chamber and he's given the electric chair, which has never legally been used anywhere in the world up to this point. And there's really a great political backstory, business backstory that's going on that's dealing with um, Westinghouse, who was the creator of alternating electricity, which is what the electric chair uses, and it was chosen for that reason because of what J.P. Morgan and Thomas Edison were saying was too dangerous. So they wanted the death penalty to have alternating electricity, and Westinghouse fought it tooth and nail. And many people believe that J.P. Morgan influenced the court in its decision in upholding this use of technology as the court did so. The objective of the chair is to extinguish life, so Kemmler, you're going down. And that becomes one ugly execution. Um, they actually pumped him with a thousand volts for about 15 seconds. That didn't work, so they gave him a second charge for something like six or seven minutes at 2,000 volts. His hair was singeing, his skin was burning off, blood was coming out of his vessels on his face. The odor, people said, was just intolerable. People started getting sick, they wanted to get out of there, and it took him eight or nine minutes to die. One of the reporters on the way out, it was actually, I believe, the head coroner for New York State, and they asked him what it was like, and they said they would have been better if they had used an ax. But the Supreme Court said that New York had a right to do so, so the electric chair became the preferred method of death across the United States for the next about 70 or 80 years before we started getting into lethal injection. Lethal injection usually involves two or three, sometimes four drugs, and it was a four-drug cocktail that became challenged in, in 2008 in Bayes versus Reese, where really they're challenging the use of a four-drug cocktail, the main drug being sodium pentothal, which is kind of the knocker outer drug. And the court is going to rule that this four-drug cocktail is going to be okay, even though there are cases before that where people were taking a long time to die, weren't being knocked out necessarily. And the court basically says, unless there's a substantial and objective risk to human pain and suffering, then you know, it's good to use, and that the petitioners had not shown that there was a serious risk. Basically, the court says, look, if someone makes an accident and someone dies because of an accident and there's pain involved, we can't throw the whole system out. We have to leave it up to the states. We have to let them decide. So the four drug cocktail is basically legalized across the United States, and it's at that point that a lot of pressure gets put on these drug manufacturers in Europe to cut off the supply of sodium pentothal hoping that, you know, death penalty won't occur anymore. And of course that doesn't happen. The states begin to look for um, a different drug and that drug becomes mitozolam. Mitozolam, which was never really used fully as a, a sedative, but kind of has that effect, begins to be used in states that can't get their hands on sodium pentothal. 
There's a few unfortunate examples of mitozolam being used in a very unfortunate manner. There's actually four or five examples, but um, the wood example in Arizona is probably the most grotesque. They had to inject this guy 15 times with the drug because he, he just wouldn't get knocked out. Um, the actual execution of Mr. Wood in Arizona took two hours two hours. There was enough time to have a half hour conversation with a federal judge trying to get a stay at execution, but Wood eventually died during that phone call. So it's examples because of that, that these new group of um, inmates in Oklahoma are going to the Supreme Court in Glossop versus Gross saying that, you know, you said we should show substantial risk. We believe there's substantial risk. You shouldn't be using this drug cocktail anymore. And Alito writes the decision. It's backed up by um, Scalia and Thomas. And basically they say, you know, no go. We're going to leave it up to the states that look, there have been courts before you got here that have already looked at your claims. Those are the fact-finding courts, and they have found that uh, the use of this drug does not violate the Eighth Amendment, that there isn't a substantial risk of unnecessary pain, that if there, again, is you know a few examples, that's not enough. And then Alito goes on to say two things. He says, in the future, you have to prove it. The state doesn't have to prove that the drug is safe. You have to prove that the drug is unsafe. And secondly, you have to prove that if the drug is unsafe, there isn't a different option that you couldn't take. There isn't a safer option. Um, if there is a safer option, you should take that option. You shouldn't be coming to us. And in the dissent, there's a Sotomayor dissent and a Breyer dissent. Breyer specifically goes after the nature of the death penalty in an all-inclusive way in his dissent. He points out that since 1972 in Furman versus Georgia, where the court basically said there was a problem with the death penalty and the states needed to fix it, and supposedly they fixed it in Gregg versus Georgia in 1976, and Breyer is saying it's not fixed. We have all of these examples where we can show that it's being unfairly applied, that there is sometimes a what some people would claim a racist effect of the death penalty, and that there have been cases where people have been proved to be innocent that have been given the death penalty. That this should be enough for us as a society to be civilized enough to put the death penalty in the rearview mirror, and Scalia goes nuts. Supposedly, in uh, the reading of the decisions, he kind of goes off his paper a little bit and really attacks Breyer's arguments as googly glop. He states that, you know, he must have missed the Enlightenment, that the Constitution itself includes execution for treason, and in the Fifth Amendment, you know, if there is a due process, um, we can take your life, and that all of this uh, talk about the death penalty being unconstitutional is um, nonsensical. But this is a win. It's a win for conservatives. It's a win for death penalty advocates, and it's a win for states' right advocates that claim this should be left up to the people. This should be left up to state legislatures, not to the Supreme Court. And Scalia even mentioned the gay marriage decision um, by saying, look, you know, the court wants to you know, rule the people by coming out with these decisions. Not this time. This time, the people are going to decide for themselves. So what have you decided? Down below, you can leave it, whether you want to talk about the death penalty or the use of lethal injection or whatever you want to do. Just keep it civil down below. And thanks for watching, guys. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that right now by clicking that button. How funky and free is that? And I'll always say, where attention goes, energy flows. We hope we grew your brain. See you next time, guys.